All right, hey everybody, welcome back uh, to class, Coronavirus Edition 2020. Um, I'm here with you guys. This is for my 10 a.m. to 10.50 a.m. Chapman University class, uh, Philosophy 101, Spring 2020. Um, it's a little early, it's before class time. I'm just here to get things established uh, well in advance of the 10, 10 a.m. hour. So you guys will start filing in um, at you know, any time, and I'm right here ready for you when you are. So let's just see the numbers as people start to attend. I see one. Nice to see you there. We're just waiting for people to show up. It was pretty good the first hour, 9 to 9.50. We had full attendance pretty much. Uh, so hopefully we get the same in this case, and hopefully you guys are doing really well, staying safe, and... Uh, being healthy over there, wherever you guys are at right now. But yeah, once 10 a.m. comes around, we will go over some of these questions on the study guide. I've got my copy right here. Um, I got the whiteboard, as you guys can see, right here behind me. And um, this is going to be the new format going forward until further notice. We're just going to be doing online lectures like this. And uh, all the different instructional methods and evaluations are going to be submitted electronically. Um, and we're all in this together and we're going to be fine. But yeah, this is the first time that we're going to have our first online meeting. <clears throat> and it's a little bit of an adjustment period, but I think we'll be fine. I'm pretty good with the internet and, you know, YouTube and computers and stuff. So I think that uh, you could have done worse in terms of having a professor ready, you know, to, to switch to this format. But yeah, right now it's 9.53, so no big rush. But um People, I'm sure, will start tuning in right around the hour. So I'm just kicking it. <clears throat> but yeah, um, it's a review session today and Wednesday. Um, as I said, I think in some messages that I sent to the class um, and in my in-class notifications to you guys last week, uh, that I've, I'm done with your guys' essays, so any student can email me um, to receive their score, and if they would like to have comments, I can also send them a uh, copy of the comments written on the essays themselves, uh, which justify the grade, but um, I'm teaching today. Um, I'm out at the university at the office um, doing these different live casts and stuff until about 3.45, and then I'll be home at about 5 p.m., so once I get home at 5, I'll open my inbox and respond to, you know, all the different student um, inquiries about their essay grade. But they're definitely done and you'll be getting your scores uh, as soon as you request them later today. And then the next thing coming up is our midterm exam on, uh, on Friday. Um, and that's why we're taking today's meeting and Wednesday to get prepared for that. So I've got the study guide and really today the main thing is to just go over as many different questions on it as we can. Um, so you, you should have access to your own copy, and um, once 10 a.m. begins, I'll just field questions from students, and we'll go over the uh, topics on the list in whatever order that you would prefer. Um, then these videos will be archived to the same YouTube channel that you can you know access and uh, review at any later time if you would like to go back and uh, check the notes again, um, you know, and prepare yourself as best you can for the uh, tests, assignments, and everything else. Um, and it's also nice, I guess, it kind of creates a permanent record of the uh, of the class so that even in the future, you know, you can look back um, to the stuff that you were learning at this time. So um, it's kind of interesting and unique. Um, of course, wouldn't have preferred to have to do it under these circumstances, but, um, but not to worry. Everything's being okay in the end. So yeah, it's it's 9.55. I see four so far. Thank you guys for being here. Um, five, okay. Attendance is starting to fill in. Good to know. And um, you know, I'm not going to really get into the questions and stuff until 10. I just want to give everybody ample time to, to find their way to their devices and get their viewing set up ready. Um, but when you guys type questions um, in the... Um, see if you're using your laptop probably 
um, I'll see those questions and uh, I will respond in real time. So this should be somewhat interactive. Um, when a student asks a question, since I don't think that their questions will be displayed in your um, viewing field, I'll just verbally state the questions so that everyone understands what I'm seeing um, on the live chat. But so far, we got nine of us here looking good. And um, still a couple minutes till, till our official class time. <clears throat> Hope you guys have been doing well. Um, got a lot of supplies. <laughs> It's getting hard to find stuff at the grocery store, but thankfully I uh, prepared in advance and I have plenty of stuff, but you know, you worry about some pe folks not having it. <clears throat> Best kept secret is the Aldi store over here in Long Beach. That's where they got a lot of uh, available groceries every day getting restocked. So, you know, I'm hanging in there just like you guys. Okay, so, so far 12 of us are there. Nice. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, and I mean, um, for the foreseeable future, until further notice, until normal operations resume everywhere, um, we're going to be moving on this online instructional format, I'm trying to make it a seamless, uh, smooth transition for everybody. Um, so we're on it together and doing the best we can, but I think that, that we're going to have a good experience and a, and a successful class um, doing this. So we're up to 14, looking great. Really appreciate you guys uh, attending today um, and getting in your review session. Let's see, still waiting a couple minutes and then we'll really get it going. 15 people are here, nice. <clears throat> Let's see, 16, okay, really good. Um, to those in attendance, viewing this live cast, oh, we're up to 18. Awesome. Seems like we're going to get a full house or whatever, or you know, any comment that you would like, um, and then I can uh, can see who who's here and what it looks like. So go ahead, just let me know. Let's just see your little chats, and that's also good. You'll get some experience um, typing in some questions, and therefore, if you haven't done this before. Okay, Bridger, hi, nice to see you. Hope you're doing. Hope you're doing well. Who else is in here? <clears throat> Anna, awesome. Hope you're doing good. Good morning to you guys. Who else is in here? Brian, cool. All right, Andy, Caesar, nice. Brian, Sophia, Emily, William. All right. This is great. Thanks so much, guys. Jessica, Victoria, Paula. Mm hmm. Cool. Good, good news. Okay, cool. You, Nelly, Misty, Annie, Lily, Olivia. Cool. You guys are great. This is uh, this is exactly how it should be. Jordan, sweet. Okay. Well, you know, it's pretty much ten, um, and we've got twenty-one here in attendance. I see a lot of you guys tapping in and chatting, so that's awesome. Let's get it started. Um, this is review session. This is Monday, March 16th uh, for the 10 a.m. to 1050 class. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Lane. Um, so now it's review session time. So basically, this is going to be similar to the way that we would have run it if, it, if we'd had an in-person meeting. Everyone's got their copy of the study guide. I sent these around a little while back. There's a list of 40 questions on the list. Um, I'm going to basically take 10 of these questions. Hey, Jason. I'm going to take 10 of these questions off of the list, and on Friday morning, I'm going to send um, an email to all members of the class through Blackboard, which will contain the test questions. And then you're going to have um, a window of time to return to me an email with your um, submitted answers electronically. So as an attached file would be the best. Um, so we just don't know which 10 questions I'll pick. But you'll have to answer six of ten, and you'll get a set window of time, and you'll email submit it to me um, on Friday, the day of the exam. And that's how we're going to run this midterm. Um, but today and on Wednesday, and whatever other additional time that we manage to squeeze in, we have uh, these interactive meetings to try and go over the study guide. So I would like you guys to just direct me to the questions, whichever that you would like to hear a little bit about or that you'd like a little bit of um, uh, 
um, explanation for. And, um, and then we'll just go in whatever order that you prefer. So I see your questions in the chat bar over here. So uh, when you're ready, let me hear what number of questions that you think would be um, most important to talk about. And we'll just go in that order. So let me know. Just refer to your study guides. It's not a lecture meeting today, right? These are review sessions. That's according to our syllabus and schedule. So it's not a typical meeting where I'm telling you guys new information. They're just going over the study guide and trying to get ready. So let's use the time wisely. Let me see from you. Any questions on the list? Uh, I'd be happy to just go into them right away. So let's see. What's the first? <clears throat> you got to let me know. What's the first one you want to talk about? <clears throat> Number 22, okay. And Harden, okay, so a couple of questions. Let's start with the 22, because I saw that question first. Um, well, what 22 asks is this, and we'll, we'll talk about trolley problem. Okay, all those questions are great. So first of all, 22, what it says is explain Mill's claim that happiness is the only thing that we pursue as an end and not as a means. Okay. So this is a question about the writing of John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian moral philosopher. Um, he argues that the right action is the action that generates the most overall um, happiness for the greatest number of people. Lives where we seek to maximize overall happiness, hey Kaylee, it, the reason that he thinks that that's the right kind of moral principle to live by is because happiness or pleasure, as he sees it, is the only thing that we pursue as an end and not as a means. So what is an end? The word end refers to a goal or an objective. And a means is something that is used to attain a goal. So when the author says that happiness is the only thing that we pursue as an end and not as a means, he's just saying, in other words, that happiness is the only goal that we've got. Everything else in life is a means to the end of getting happiness. Uh, but happiness is itself the overall objective of every action that anybody takes. If you think about the motivation you have to even watch this live cast, it's in the effort to do well on a midterm and you want to do well on that because it'll help you to graduate, let's say, and you want to graduate as a way of helping you to get a good career, which will be in terms of getting wealth. And then you want that so that you can have purchasing power and you want that basically because it makes you happy. So the question is just asking you to reflect on and explain Mill's claim that the only thing that we pursue in life is happiness and everything else is sought after as a stepping stone to that goal. Um, okay, so that would be 22. Next thing I see on this list of uh, student submitted questions uh, is about Hardin. Okay, so Garrett Hardin. Um, there's just a few questions on about him, number 35 and 6. So Garrett Hardin wrote the paper. Okay, we'll cover that too, Bridger, for sure, number 36. But for for now, let's go over, yeah, both, 35 and 6. So Garrett Hardin wrote the essay, Lifeboat Ethics, The Case Against Helping the Poor. In the essay, he argues that we do not have a moral obligation to assist the global poor, and that in his argument, uh, it would not even be productive um, or beneficial in the long run of time to do that. <coughs> so the lifeboat example is a metaphor that he gives at first in his essay to try and explain why he thinks we don't have these obligations. So he says, imagine this, each uh, wealthy nation is symbolized by a lifeboat floating in the ocean. Um, so there's like, you know, lifeboat United States or Germany, France, Britain, whatever, you know, each country that is wealthy industrialized nation is symbolized by one lifeboat. Okay, now there's people in the lifeboats and they are to stand for the citizens of that wealthy country. Now, in the example, the lifeboat, let's say, has 50 people in it with a capacity for 60 maximum. And it's also described that there's 100 people in the water that are not on any boat and that are just struggling uh, for survival that could easily drown in that water and that are looking to those on the lifeboat for some manner of assistance, help, or a handout of, of some kind, a helping hand. And um, the argument is, well, okay, so say you wanted to bring on all the 100 people to the boat um, in case they all would like help. Well, then that would overwhelm the capacity of the boat, and it would therefore anybody, even a smaller number. Maybe you could take on 10. He considers this. But if 10 people are brought on, let me make sure. Hey, can you still see me? Uh, I just want to make sure my connection did not get interrupted. Can I get a quick comment just to make sure that that's true? Everything's good? Is it true? Huh. 
please, if you may. Um, can somebody just type yes? Okay, thank you. Just just double checking because on my side it said connection problem for a second. Anyways, back to what I was saying. Okay, thank you guys very much. I got you. Yeah, not to worry. Good. Um, so yeah, so suppose you brought on just ten. Well, that's not going to overwhelm the boat, but it's going to fill it out to its max capacity. And what he says is that would also kind of come at a cost. It would come at the cost of the uh, safety margin which is usually good to have, to have a little bit of additional room and not have something filled to its maximum capacity. So he thinks that the third option, which is his preferred choice, is the harshest of all, and that's to prevent anybody from uh, gaining entry to the boat and to be kind of vigilant in guard against those that would board without permission. Now, um, he uses that metaphor to explain his basic thinking about why we shouldn't have an obligation to help the poor, that there's basically too many to help, and that any attempt to help is merely going to create a bigger problem in the end. Um, so that's the lifeboat metaphor. And then after that 36, so tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is basically just this simple idea that um, when there are public resources that are uh, available to all in common, then they're destined to fail for two big reasons, because uh, they'll be overused and they'll be poorly maintained and kept up. So that's a recipe for the, the commons to fail. He gives an example of an acre of land. He says, suppose that you took an acre of land, which is used for farming, and you um, opened it to the public for public use. He thinks that in that case, you'd easily predict what, could ha what would happen, that everyone would rush to take um, some of the land with their farm animals, and it would quickly be overgrazed. And since it would be overgrazed, it would ruin the soil and the land, and it would then not be useful for even a smaller number of people. So what happens when it was turned into a public resource is that it was destroyed by too many people using it and no one trying to keep up and take uh, clean up after themselves. Now, if it was a privately owned acre, that would not happen because the private owner does not want to overrun his own land um, and therefore um, ruin the value of the investment that he has put into it. So private resources are well maintained and not overutilized. Public resources, just the opposite. And that's one reason that he's trying to advise against the wisdom of uh, supporting initiatives like the World Food Bank, because he thinks that they're also um, commons in disguise, where from which a lot of people will take from the commons, but without any a matching feeling of obligation to wean themselves off of it and to support its long-term sustainability. So commons fail, the World Food Bank is a commons, and um, that's one additional reason that he argues that we do not, do not have an obligation to assist the global poor. Um, okay, so I've talked to you guys, I guess, about 35 and 6 and number 22. There's plenty more questions. Uh, I see another one above. Could you talk about Thompson's solution to the trolley problem? Okay, so let's try and get into that. First of all, um, let, me, let me go over two of the trolley problem questions with you because if we speak about the solution, uh, it would be better for context if we know what the problem is first that we're trying to solve. So I'm going to mention uh, 37 and then... <clears throat> 39. First of all, 37. It says, explain the trolley tr problem by explaining bystander at the switch and transplant. Okay, so the trolley problem is a problem that can only be explained with reference to the comparison of these two cases. The problem has to do with the way that audiences respond to these two scenarios. Basically, when they are given the trolley case, they say that the action of the bystander is not wrong. But when they are given the transplant case, they are told that the action of the surgeon, well, they say that the action of the surgeon is wrong. So uh, understand me, the vast majority of audiences think that the bystander is not doing anything wrong when he flips the switch and sends it towards one person. But the vast majority of the same audience members will say that when the transplant surgeon operates, he's doing something wrong. And so the problem is simply this question, why? For what reason do people say that one of these cases is something wrong to do, transplant, and the other case, trolley driver or bystander, is not something wrong to do? Why are people responding differently to the two cases? So just a quick reminder about the cases, right? First of all, bystander at the switch. Here's how it looks. You have a trolley. Inside there's a driver, but they're passed out. The trolley is going ahead straight forward and it'll hit these five people on the track. Okay. 
And then there's a fork in the ro uh, trolley path. It could be sent to this other direction where there's one. In this example of bystander, this guy can't hit the switch because he's currently incapacitated. But there's a switch, and there's a guy standing by at the switch. And he can do it. He can send it in the other direction. Now, concerning this case, the audience's overwhelming response is, this is not wrong. He may switch the switch, and that's not wrong. But when transplant is given, in comparison to that, people say it is wrong. In transplant, you got these five people, right? Dying of different type of organ failure, so they would like a transplant. And then there's this one healthy person over here who, if they were killed, right, then their organs could be given to the five and save their lives. But everybody says, well, that's wrong. That's not wrong. This is wrong. And so the problem that question 37 is asking about is just this question, why, why do people say this is wrong but not this? And the reason that that seems to be puzzling to many is because although the reactions are different, the cases are having certain similarities. Like in both cases, it's five die or one dies, and there's a person who could intervene who causes the death of the one instead of the five. But in this case, this is judged not to be wrong, but over here it is wrong. And so essentially that's the problem that Thompson says, you know, we're trying to solve by means of this um, essay. Now, what's the solution that Thompson does give to the problem? All right. Well, that's about number 39. So how Thompson solves it is this. She says, it seems that we think it is morally permissible to redirect a threat from a bigger to a smaller group of people. But the thing is, it just has to be the same threat. Okay, and in the bystander and other trolley cases, that is seen because it's one trolley, right? That could either hit five or if someone intervenes, it won't hit five, but it'll hit one. But the point is that it's the same threat. It's the same trolley that's going to either hit five or one. Over here in transplant, though, there's a completely different description. Five people are dying of organ failure, but if this surgeon gets involved to save their lives, it's not organ failure that's being transferred over to this person. It's like a homicidal surgeon killing them by murder. So this is a set of two different threatening things, organ failure versus the homicidal act of the surgeon. And in this case, there's just one and the same threatening thing, a trolley, which will either be harming five or instead one. There's a second clause, though, to Thompson's solution, okay? And that second clause is what shows the need for the man on the uh, bridge case. Well, the man on the bridge case shows the need for the second clause. Okay, so keep in mind what I just said, that according to Thompson, it's permissible to direct a threat from bigger to fewer people, number of people, as long as it's the same threat. But then the man on the bridge case shows that she has to add an additional um, clause there. So man on the bridge case is like this. <coughs> In Man on the Bridge, there's no bystander, there's just this bridge. The bridge overlooks the trolley, and the trolley passes underneath the bridge. On it, there's one person here, and then there's another individual that's just described as large. And um, in this case, the one action that can prevent the death of five is if this guy's toppled over by him onto the trolley's path, and therefore the oncoming trolley will just strike and kill him, but he'll block it from hitting the other five. That's why he's described as large. Now, this man on the bridge case is a case where the audience pretty much all says that's wrong. But it shows that she has to add an additional sentence to her solution because the original solution was it's okay to switch the threat from a bigger to smaller number of people as long as it's the same threat. Well, in this case, it is the same threat. It's a trolley that's either going to hit five or if the guy gets toppled into its path, it'll just hit one. So same trolley, same threat. But it's judged to be wrong. Why? She says, well, it's because it fails the second clause, because the means of diverting the threat also have to not involve an important rights violation. So when you're just flipping a switch to divert the trolley's path, flipping a switch is not itself a violation of an important right. But if you have to push somebody, right, then the act of pushing, placing hands on them and basically attacking them physically is a violation of an important right that they have. So basically, here is Thompson's solution. You can shift a threat from a bigger to smaller group. It has to just be the same threat. But number two... The way that you shift the threat matters also. So, not the same threat, but the way that you shift it cannot violate an important right. And that's what goes wrong with Man on the Bridge. That's why she thinks people judge that to be wrong. Not because it's not the same threat, it is, but because in this case, the person is placed in the direction of the threat, 
by means of the action of pushing rather than flipping a switch. Okay, so just now talking to you guys about a few things having to do with the trolley questions. We talked about 37, what's the problem itself? The problem is to explain why audiences respond differently to bystander and transplant. And then we talked about 39, which is Thompson's solution. And Thompson solves it by saying you can shift a threat from bigger to fewer number as long as it's the same threat and as long as the means of diverting it don't violate any important rights. The man on the bridge case is mentioned as well, just to demonstrate the need for that second clause of her solution. Okay, and we didn't talk about loop, but maybe we can get back to it later. I see a couple of other questions students are asking about, so let's maybe move around if that's fine with you guys. Um, so Nellie is asking about number 12. Okay, 12 says this, explain Nagel, Ernest Nagel's critique of mystical experience as a source of evidence for God's existence. So what that question is asking about is um, a criticism that Ernest Nagel made in his paper, Does God Exist? In that essay, he briefly discussed an additional argument that some people give for God's existence, which is the argument from religious experience. Sometimes it's called the argument from mystical experience. Okay, so this is what that type of argument is. It's a person's argument who says, I believe in God because I had a powerful religious experience, and that's what revealed that God exists to me. Okay, so it could be a person who thinks that something miraculous happened, or they just had a very powerful spiritual type of experience. Whatever the case is, they use that experience as their reason for saying they believe in God. Okay, now what is the problem with this argument? Nagel has two big problems with it. First of all, he said, um, the evidence that is given is an experience. And an experience is something personal. It cannot be displayed for other people to examine on their own. So that's a problem. He says, this is evidence, but it cannot be made public. It's not like I can invite you to just, you know, observe my experience that I had if I did have a religious experience. So that's one problem, that the, uh, the experiences themselves cannot be subjected to uh, independent analysis by other observers. And then the second problem is that when it comes to these claimed religious experiences, like a miracle happened or whatever, or the person just felt like a powerful connection to some supernatural being. The author claims there are always alternative natural explanations for the reported experiences. So a person may just think that, uh, I don't know, the individual who says this was just going through an emotional breakdown or a mental breakdown, or maybe they were on drugs or maybe sleep deprived or, you know. So any of these different naturalistic explanations for the experience could substitute for the claimed supernatural basis. So basically, these are weak arguments, so according to Nagel, because they're based on experiences that cannot be shared, and they're also based on claims that can be explained without any supernatural assumptions. So those are two problems, according to him, and that's about number 12. Okay, so I see Jordan is asking about two and four. So let's go ahead and talk about those, um, as long as those are the most recent questions I see students have mentioned. Everybody's still here? Everyone's doing good? I hope so. Um, you know, we're just dealing with this live cast virtual lecture. Um, hopefully it's going well for you. You guys are having a good morning. Um, but yes, we continue, all right? So number two and four. Question two. <clears throat> it says, explain the method of argument known as reductio ad absurdum. Okay, so this is a um, Latin phrase, which means originally to reduce to absurdity. It's a way of arguing in logic. So the way that a reductio ad absurdum argument goes is that you want to prove a claim, and so you assume the opposite of the claim you are actually trying to prove, and you show that if that were the case, this opposite assumption, that something impossible or absurd would be implied by that, and therefore it can't be true. So like, as an example, suppose that I am engaged in debate with a person thinking that this earth is flat, and I say it is not flat. Okay. Well, if I wanted to make my case by means of the reductio method, me, the person who's arguing that it's not flat, as I hope we all do understand, I would suppose this to my uh, opponent. I would say, okay, well, it's not flat, buddy, but like, let's say it was. If it was, then under those circumstances, things would clearly just fall off the edge of the earth. But since that does not happen, you know, that's an absurd thing. So this clearly is false. Therefore, it's not flat. You know, like, so I, what I just did there was I assumed temporarily for the sake of argument my opponent's view, but I only do it in order to show that that would imply or, you know, result in something absurd or impossible, and thus cannot be the case. So my uh, claim 
in opposition to that is true. Now, this was used by Anselm and other authors in our class, but it was first uh, mentioned to us by the work of Anselm, because Anselm argues that God exists, and the reason he argues that is because the idea of the greatest conceivable being implies existence, because it's greater to really exist in reality, um, not just the mind. And since God's definition is greatest, he would have to exist in all those different ways, not just one. Um, but he says, to those that think God only exists in the mind, they're wrong. Let's suppose for the sake of reductio, that he did only exist in the mind. Well, if God only existed in the mind, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being, which is absurd, and therefore that can't be true. So he exists in the mind and in reality. Um, so that would be a way that it was used in one author's um, writing. You could also, I guess, argue that Gamilo used the same kind of strategy by saying that Anselm's logic does not work, but assume it did, then we could prove that the lost island exists, which is absurd. So... That's reductio. It's trying to like turn the tables on your opponent by saying, well, if what you claim is true, then how can you explain this absurd consequence of that? Uh, and therefore to eliminate or disqualify this contrary supposition by means of showing that it leads to something absurd. Okay, so that's number two. Um, I see a new question written about how to talk about the triage objection. Let's get to that in a minute, but first I uh, want to make sure, make sure I don't leave behind number four because another question is about number four. Okay, so number four just says, explain Moore's, G.E. Moore's argument that existence is not a predicate. Okay, so what Moore is reacting to there is Anselm's argument that God exists. Anselm's argument says that um, God being defined as the greatest conceivable being has to exist in the mind and in reality, because that's greater than just existing in the mind. Um, G.E. Moore says the problem with this argument is that it's treating existence as though it was an attribute of something, in other words, a predicate, as as G.E. Moore sees it. Um, Anselm has just simply said that to exist is greater than not to exist, and it's therefore a quality that would be better if you had it rather than not. But Moore says this is totally mistaken because the concept of existence is not an attribute, and therefore it doesn't fit the argument in the way that Anselm had hoped. Now, how does he try to show that existence is not an attribute? He has a specific example, okay? The example is about this comparison between the statements involving a predicate, namely growls, and another set of statements which replaces growls with exists. So basically he had these different examples. Let me erase a little here. So cons consider this sentence. Tigers exist, or sorry, tigers growl. That's what I meant to say. Tigers growl versus over here, tigers exist. Now, he says that the breakdown in the way that the meaningfulness uh, kind of gets lost can be shown when we add some modifiers to these statements here. So suppose that I go with this statement, most tigers growl. No problem. That makes sense. Most tigers growl. It just means that there's a set of tigers, and there's more of them that have this feature and less of them that don't. So when it comes to growling, all that's claiming is that majority of the tigers do have that feature. But if I give you this other statement, which just replaces growl with exists, it's just weird. Most tigers exist. Okay, now think about that. Most tigers exist does not make sense, because what it's saying is that if you were to take the whole class of tigers, you've got a majority of them existing, and then a minority of them that don't exist, but now we're already no, making no sense, because you can't talk about two sets one with a certain number that does exist, and another set with a smaller number that, of things that don't exist. Because things that don't exist can't be numbered. Only things that do exist can even be given a number. So most tigers exist is strange, incomprehensible, absurd, but most tigers growl is no problem. And what he's showing you, he thinks, is that that demonstrates that existence is not a real predicate. Because if it was, we wouldn't lose meaningfulness when we just replace one predicate with another one. Um, Another example that could be used to make the same point is about some don't. So some tigers don't growl. Okay, fine. Maybe there's some tigers that just don't, for whatever reason, make that type of growling noise. But if I say some tigers don't exist, I don't have any similar understanding of how to make sense of that statement. Does it mean that there's some tigers that are like Tony the tiger, like an imaginary character? Or does it just mean that there are some things that are fiction? But whatever it means, it's not clear. So by means of the comparison between the growls sentences and the 
correlative exists sentences, we see this breakdown in coherence and meaningfulness. And that is what the author thinks serves to explain or show to any reader that existence is not a predicate. And since it's not a predicate, as he argues, Anselm's argument breaks down, it doesn't work. Okay, so that would be the case of number four. And we still got plenty of time, about half time of our uh, class meeting period. So everybody, I hope you're doing really well. Um, seems like we got 24 here watching and that's good. Um, keep in mind if someone tuned in a little bit later than the very beginning, um, I was just making some general statements about the class at first, which is that I've graded everybody's, uh, sorry, first essays. And you can email me uh, individually at any time today or in the next few days, whenever you want. And I'll tell each different student that does send me such a message what their grade was. And if they would request it, I could also send you a copy uh, scanned or otherwise of the paper with the comments. So if you want some feedback to, to, to look at as well. But anyway, um, I'm at the university teaching and doing these live casts until a little later. So I'll be responding to such messages after probably 5 p.m. But uh, I know a lot of you guys probably would like to know your scores and that's good, but they are all done. And um, I'm just gonna reply to individual messages about them. So anyways, that's done and behind us and we're looking forward to this midterm next. But um, okay, new question I see on this uh, chat. Um, the triage. Um, the triage objection to the obligation to assist argument is the question. Okay, so <clears throat> triage is actually quite interesting and kind of almost weirdly, you know, with the timing that uh, there's actually real life discussions big time going on right now about the exact idea of triage because we're going to have triage in this country if we uh, overwhelm the hospitals uh, with a bunch of sick people. But anyway, uh, to the objection of, of Singer. So Peter Singer argues, hey, we have an obligation to assist the global poor. Why? because he says, well, if you can prevent bad things without making huge sacrifices, then you ought to. And he says absolute poverty is bad, and we're in a position where we can at least prevent some without making huge sacrifices, you know, because we have so much surplus wealth over and beyond our basic needs that we could give some of it up and divert it to the cause of the poor without really undermining our well-being in any serious way. Okay, well, that's the argument, but what's this triage objection? Okay, so the triage objection says that when you do uh, implement triage policy, you're supposed to not necessarily attend to the people with the worst case injuries um, or sicknesses because they're going to be essentially a lost cause. So in a situation where you have too many injured and sick persons, not enough medical um, support, like not enough doctors available, so surplus of injured persons, deficit of available medical personnel, um, what do you do? Well, you have to make these tough-minded decisions about how to ration out care in a way that will secure the maximum amount of survival. So they say, don't um, help the people in the, with the worst injuries first, because they're likely to die even with help. Also, don't help the people who have the most minor injuries, because they're likely to survive even if they don't get immediate help. So according to triage principles, you'd start off with the people that are in the middle ground category having injuries that are on a level of seriousness that they may die if they don't get help, but they would probably survive if they do. Um, now, according to this type of thinking, maybe Singer has made a bad argument by advising us to support and help out the people that are so poor in the world that they're likely to starve without assistance. Um, you know, and so you could argue that that's kind of like the lost cause contingent in a triage scenario, and attending to their needs is a basic waste of time because it won't eliminate the larger problem that they face and it could even expand the size of their population in ways that will delay the problem for the future and make it even bigger in the future when the group of poor people that do need help is even larger. So, I mean, basically the critic of Singer's argument that appeals to triage would say that it's a misguided attempt to try and save the people that are in the worst case scenario um, we wouldn't do that in a triage um, situation. So we shouldn't do this uh, comparative thing in the case of global aid to the poor. Don't give money to the people that are absolutely the worst off poor because they're likely to remain poor and just become bigger in total population numbers through the provision of such aid. If anyone were to receive aid, it would be people that are in the developing uh, world but making a transition to a more developed living standard, not the worst case scenario of absolute poverty, which is what Singer argues in favor of. So that's the triage objection. Um, okay, so what's next? I've 
dealt with the questions that were listed in that first um, set of chats that I've seen here. But we still have, you know, some time, 15, 20 minutes or so. So don't want to end yet. Let's see what else you guys have for me. And um, this is just part one of review. We're going to have another installment on Wednesday. Uh, I'll try to, I think, also supply a, like a virtual office hour on Thursday or so. Um, normally, my office hours are after class Friday, but that would not benefit people for their midterm preparation. So I'm going to move it this week to happen before uh, the exam on a Thursday so that anyone who wants to take advantage of it can get a little last um, you know, help from me. But OK, I see some new questions. So let's see, 23 from Jordan there. OK, so Mill's response to utilitarianism is theory for swine. Um, all right. So first of all, utilitarianism. It's an ethical theory provided by John Stuart Mill which says that the right action is whichever action promotes the most overall happiness for the greatest number of people. And he has different reasons for thinking that's the correct theory, but basically that's the essential idea, that you should try your best every time you do things to take whatever action will create the most overall happiness for all affected by the action. Now, one objection to this that Mill tries to contend with is that this seems to be, to some, a theory fit for swine. Why? Well, because it could be argued that the... The, the priority placed on pursuing pleasure and happiness is something that's a little bit too um, animalistic for an intelligent thing like a human. That swine or pigs are more suited to um, an all-consuming pursuit of pleasure than a human would be. Now, Mill understands this criticism, but he rejects it for this reason. He says it's not a theory for swine, though, because all I said was pursue pleasure and happiness to the highest extent possible for the greatest number. But he says this, that when it comes to humans, there's two types of pleasures. There's lower and higher. And he corrects his critic by saying, I'm not just talking about go out and like pursue the, all the animalistic lower pleasures, uh, but also the higher ones, which in his mind are even more important. So lower pleasures are pleasures that are capable of being enjoyed by animals. So like food, uh, sleep, you know, sex, whatever basic things that animals can and do enjoy. But then higher pleasures are things that are only enjoyable to human beings because basically they're beyond the capacity of less intelligent creatures to even comprehend. So like, you know, if you're enjoying some movie or uh, music or technology or literature, art, uh, if you like the academic study of philosophy, mathematics, science, physics, history, whatever, those are things that animals, of course, do not know anything about. And so those are higher sources of pleasure, according to Mill. And therefore, Mill's reaction to his criticism is that, um, yeah, I said to pursue pleasure, but you must have thought that I meant just the lower pleasures, and that's why you're saying this is all for swine. And Mill says, no, I'm talking about all pleasures that man is capable of enjoying, but even more so the higher pleasures, which he takes care to argue, are of greater value and better in, in comparable terms to the lower pleasures. So... That's his reaction to that. Lower and higher pleasures are different. I'm not just saying live like a swine, even though I am talking about pleasure. And, you know, a critic might have uh, just heard the word pleasure and, and the person saying go out and pursue as much, promote as much as possible, and had that misunderstanding by oversimplifying the concept of pleasure to the, the bestial, animalistic pleasures of lower creatures like pigs. Okay. So that's about uh, 22 or 3, sorry, 23. I see another question from um, Paula here about 19 and 20. Okay, we can go into that. So, um, Brian, you're asking about the essay grades. No, I'm saying this. They're not on Canvas. They're going to be provided to individual students who email me and request them, and then I'll give you your score in a personal email that I return back to you. I like to have that personal touch. So request your grades, please, from me by email, and I'll send you back your score today uh, after I get home at 5 p.m. because your grades are done. Uh, I have my own electronic record keeping system and physical uh, record keeping system. So I'm ready to give you your grades and I can send you your comments as a scanned or photocopy of the paper with the written comments. Uh, but I'm not using Blackboard as the delivery system for student grades. I'm just responding to individual messages from students. So please inquire and I'll have your grade ready. But okay, back to the listed questions, 19 and 20. Okay. Um, so number 19, explain the test that Everett suggests for gaining evidence that a certain test. Okay, so you guys maybe remember Nicholas Everett's article, Theism in Modern Science. That's where this question is coming from. Um, 
in the essay, he gave an argument. I believe it's on page 66 or so. And uh, it's on the left facing first page of his um, essay. Here's how it goes. It says, if there is a being with nature N and intentions I, then that being would produce change C in the world. Okay. And then the second premise of the argument says, but the world does not display change C. So therefore, the conclusion that's derived is that therefore there is evidence that the being does not exist. Now, um, he gave the example of like a shipwrecked sailor who's curious to know, is there perhaps another survivor who's also on the island along with me? And um, he says, okay, well, imagine that that person is looking for another fellow survivor. They, they would reason as follows. If there's another survivor like me who wants to be discovered, who wants to get off the island, then there are certain things that they would do which I would see if I looked for them. Like, so I should be able to see, I don't know, tracks or tools or a fire pit or some type of enclosure, sounds maybe. So I'd be looking for those type of signs. Now, imagine that the individual goes about the island searching for those signs and doesn't see any. Then they would have gotten evidence that there's no other person on the island. In a similar way, I, gave, I think I gave you guys an example about my own life from like when I was a little kid and you know I was hearing about Santa as a young person my assumption was, well, if Santa exists and he's trying to bring me presents or whatever, then I should see certain things when I'm sitting in front of the, you know, um, chimney and fireplace all night on Christmas. Like I should see, you know, ho, ho, ho sliding down the chimney. I should hear pitter pat of hooves or whatever. And so by staying up all night, not seeing any such signs, I had evidence then that there was no Santa. Now, so basically what's the argument that he lays out? It's if there were some being that existed and you knew what they would be like, then you could predict what behavior they would they would uh, exhibit. And if there's no signs of that behavior when you look for it, then that gives you evidence that that's not even a real being. Now, that's the question of 20, or sorry, of 19. 20 kind of is an extension of that. So with 20, we get into the details as to how is it then that this universe, according to science, isn't the sort of universe that you would think would have been created by God. Okay, so the author Everett says, well, if God created the universe and he created it just for the sake of mankind, you know, uh, we're the crown jewel of creation, created in his image, so it's all here kind of for us, then he thinks that the universe would exhibit these features. First of all, mankind would appear way early at the beginning of the universe. Second, we would appear not long after the other non-human animals. Third, the universe would not be so much vastly larger than the Earth. And fourth, that the Earth would be in the center of everything, because, you know, if the whole universe is created for the sake of us, then we should be right in the center and everything should revolve around us. Now, whatever it claims is that if you look at science, though, it seems to contradict all of those um, expectations of how the universe would be if God created it. So first of all, we are not, according to science, uh, beings that appeared early in the history of the universe. It took billions of years for e any kind of life to emerge uh, in this universe, and so we were not there at the beginning. The second thing, according to science, is that no, we did not appear soon after the other animals either. Even on the planet Earth, it took billions of years for you know, complex mammal, mammalian life, bipedal, vertebrate, um, life like us to, to develop. And so we're not early in the overall picture of the universe, nor are we early um, on the earth concerning other life forms that existed prior to us. The third thing is the universe in terms of its size is so much bigger than the earth is. And that, he says, is something that, again, would not make sense if God just created it for us. Why would he put a whole bunch of stuff there that has nothing to do with us? And then the fourth thing is that we would be in the middle, but according to science, no. Um, I mean, everybody pretty much understands that we're not even in the center of the local solar system. We rotate around the sun, not the other way around. So he would then claim that science, according to its you know, investigation of reality, seems to reveal a universe, not the sort of universe you would have thought it had it been created by God. And that's kind of like the parallel, right, to like making an assumption about what type of behavior a being would do if it existed, and then being contradicted by not seeing such uh, signs when you look for them in the world. Okay, so that's um, some information for you guys on number 20. And let's see what's next here. I see some additional questions. One is number 25, shopkeeper example. So we still have a few more minutes. You know, this is not the end of this. There's another review session to follow. That's going to be Wednesday. Uh, but let me continue because we do have some more time. So at least I can try and cover this shopkeeper thing. Okay, so Immanuel Kant, German ethical philosopher, um, he argued that only when you do an action based on the motive of duty does the action have moral worth or value. When you do an action from the motive of inclination, he says it does not have any moral value. 
So this shopkeeper's example is supposed to sh demonstrate to us the difference between um, ha acting from the motive of duty versus acting from the motive of inclination. So inclination is just when you want to do something because if you find it fun or pleasurable or enjoyable, like you're inclined to do it means you just desire or want to. And doing something from the motive of duty means mm, you don't want to even do it. You're just doing it because you know that it's what morality requires you to do. Okay, so in the shopkeeper example, one version of it is kid comes in to buy like a candy bar and he doesn't know the price, so he asks the shopkeeper how much. And the shopkeeper sees like a prime opportunity to gouge the price and rip this kid off. And he wants to do that. But he's got this other thought in the back of his mind, which is that although I want to do that, you know, I want to get that extra money and stuff, it would be wrong though. So I guess I'm going to say the right price, the, the fair, normal price but kind of only because I recognize that duty compels me to do that, not because I feel good about doing it. In fact, to the contrary, I don't feel like doing it. Now, in another version of the case, the shopkeeper gives the fair price, but because he loves to be fair and he feels good about it and it actually makes him happy to see you know, the kid treated fairly and to be the one that did it, it, makes, it fills him with joy or whatever. Now, in the second case, he's not doing anything wrong, but his action is not done for a moral reason. It's done for the pursuit of the self-interest and pleasure, so it's done from the motive of inclination. So from Kant's perspective, the first type of person that had to force themselves to abide by the moral law, even though they were not inclined to do it, is a pure case of acting from the motive of duty alone, not mixed together with any uh, ulterior motives like pleasure or happiness. Um, so yeah, Kant does think that when you act from the motive of duty, that's when an action is based on morality and it's got moral value. And when it's done from inclination, just because you want to, because you find it pleasurable or makes you happy, that's not done from the motive of duty. That's done from the motive of inclination that lacks moral worth. Okay. So that's the shopkeeper thing. Um, I see some questions here about 27 and 8. Um, okay, so 27... Quickly, I'll just talk about it. It's about the categorical imperative, another concept from the writing of Kant, Immanuel Kant. So Kant says that if you want to know what the moral law is and what it requires you to do and what it forbids you from doing, then consider this principle called the categorical imperative, which can be discovered by just using reason and reflecting on it rationally. So there's two versions of it. The first version says only act on maxims that could be universal laws that could be willed to be universal laws. Okay, and so a maxim is a person's individual principle of action behind a deliberate uh, behavior that they commit. So a maxim basically says what a person would do under certain specific conditions or circumstances. It basically takes the form, I will do some action under certain conditions. Now, to ask what it would be for a maxim to be a universal law, you simply have to convert it into a universal law statement. So instead of saying, I will do this under these circumstances, it becomes the principle that all people will do it under similar circumstances. And what Kant is basically saying there is, it's only morally permitted to do actions that have maxims which could become universal. So some actions would uh, fail this criteria. Say, for example, that I want to take a free ride on the subway when I just want to ride it. Then my maxim is, I will not pay for the subway when I take a ride. But if this was a universal law, then it would be the case that all persons do not pay for the subway when they ride. And in that case, there would no longer be a subway because it would not be funded by the uh, fare of the patrons. And so the free rider doesn't want everybody to ride for free, clearly then, because there would no longer be a subway, which, subway for him to ride for free. And other actions like that can also be imagined. If there's a line and you ought to wait in the long line or you want to cut... The cutting only works if you cut, but other people don't. If everybody cuts, then there's no point to cutting, right? Because you just lose your new position when everyone cuts in front of you. So it's only okay, basically, according to that first principle of the categorical imperative, to do actions that would be okay or that would be possible for everybody to do. And if they cannot be done by everybody, they're wrong for you to do as well. The second version of categorical imperative just says that you're not supposed to ever treat human beings as a means to an end, but always as an end in themselves. So that means don't treat people as though they were things to be used to achieve goals, but treat them as though they were the goal themselves. An end is a goal or an objective. Means are the methods used or the actions taken to obtain one's goals. And so the second version just tells you that when you do deal with other human beings, you have to respect humanity by not treating any single person as a means to an end, but rather treat them as though they were the goal in themselves. So if I stole from you to gain the value of your property, I'm treating you as a means to my own acquisition of the item. To 
derive a benefit for myself, then I'm treating you as a means toward the perceived benefit of the outcome of me lying. Um, you know, and like if I use the person as a human shield, for example, in like some horrifying scenario, then um, or if I use someone that for their organs to uh, transplant or whatever, then they'd be used as a means to the end of whatever the goal was behind doing that. So that's also forbidden according to the Kant categorical imperative version two. Um, so how are you guys doing? We're re reaching close to the end of our class time. Hopefully your other classes are running smoothly as well. Um, I'm not sure what individual professors have done, but this is the method that we are going to use going forward. We're going to be tuning in um, to this channel. So like a true YouTuber, I'm just going to ask you guys to comment, subscribe, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely have a whole series of lectures archived uh, for the end of the semester. You can go back to these, you can refer to them for posterity. In the future, you know, you may even have a little trip down memory lane and uh, you'll be able to go back and examine some of these materials that we studied at least one time in your life. But um, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Be in touch with me. Uh, inquire for your essay grades when you're ready, and I have them. Uh, so I'll respond to any such questions by email later tonight when I get home. And, um, and then we'll be prepared for the midterm on Friday. We have one more review session Wednesday. I'll try to schedule some FaceTime type of or whatever YouTube live uh, office time on Thursday. And, uh, and then we'll have the exam. Uh, for, on the day of the exam, your test period would begin at um, 10. And I'm basically going to provide everybody with um, an attachment uh, through Blackboard to give you the test form. And the test form will just have a curated list of the questions on the study guide. Then you'll have to submit electronically to me within a set period of time uh, your, res your written responses to those. And then you'll be good and off to spring break. But uh, any other questions from anybody? I'm looking at the live chat. If not, maybe just say goodbye, and I'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday in this virtual space. Does that sound good? Uh, are we all on the same page here? Just give me a little feedback if you're in the house and you're looking at this. Sounds good? Just let me know. Come on. I can't be talking just to myself here. I see 22 of you watching. So thank you. OK, awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Stay safe. Um, how long are you expecting our responses to be on the exam? Last question I'm seeing here. Well, they should be as long as necessary to answer the question in a fully detailed way. So reach for the stars. Make a maximalist answer. Write a lot. Uh, but, you know, I mean, to be fair, like probably a paragraph or two is sufficient in most cases. But I never like to give hard and fast guidelines because uh, some people have more concision than other people do. So the level of detail and accuracy should be to be as thorough and detailed as you possibly can. It will depend on the question, but for most, probably a paragraph or two is fine. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll talk soon. Have a great one. See you soon. <clears throat>